There was a time when we roamed free, when we did as we pleased, before the forces of snobbiness took over the world. They took everything from us, everything save one day. That day is ours. That day is Choptoberfest. events of the year of Choptoberfest. Leanne's got a special announcement. Hey guys, we're super excited to have our first blood drive of the year. It's located in the Free Methodist Gym over here. We do have appointments going all day, so you can come see us outside the DC from 11 to 1 today. It goes from 12 to 6 tomorrow, and you can save up to three lives just by giving blood. So come on out, we'd love to have you. If you are interested in signing up, we'll be outside the DC, like I said. If you have questions or need to contact someone, you can contact Ty Davis, Tennille Marwelli, or myself. I'm Liam Porter. Um, that's it. Please come give blood. Thanks. We have about we have about a hundred guests visiting Spring Arbor, sitting in the usual spot. Let's welcome them to chapel this morning. Thank you for being here. Last, last Wednesday we had the last Wednesday we had the privilege of hearing how somebody takes their faith and even the university concept to their heart to the least of these in her work with the children and the widows of Burundi. Today we have the opportunity of hearing somebody who, at least from the world standards, takes it to the greatest of these. Greg Clugston is a White House correspondent. He's a 1988 graduate of Spring Arbor. His radio uh, reports are heard on a thousand stations around the country. He has an office right in the White House, an opportunity to meet with presidents. And we're blessed this morning to have Greg Cluxton share with us. I'm going to have Greg come on up for prayer, stand together and gather in around Greg as we pray, and then as we worship. Gather in. Father, how exciting that here gathered in this place uh, over a thousand students who are not just learning a bunch of stuff, but becoming who you would have them to become. And not just for their benefit, but for the benefit of the kingdom around the world, as we've heard this week and as we'll hear today. We're grateful that Greg's with us, grateful for his impact in the Washington, D.C. area, his testimony, his life, his family and his heart's desire to honor you in all things. We are blessed this morning. And now as we lift our hearts together in worship, and as we hear from heaven, Father, I pray that you'd speak to our lives again. Speak to us as we become, not just as we know, and not just as we hear. And all for Christ's sake we pray. Amen.
God is with us. God is with us. God is on our side. He will make a way. Far above all we know. Far above all we hope. He has done great things. Lifted up.
deciden. morning. For a few minutes today, I'd like to talk about my work in Washington, D.C., as well as my experience here in Spring Arbor a number of years ago. I'll start off by saying that being a White House reporter is a very interesting job. It's in a unique location. People have heard of that place. It's in a powerful city. My work, as you might guess, generates a lot of questions from friends and family. What's it like inside the White House? Have you ever met the president? What do you think of the president? Most importantly, when's the government shutdown going to be over? <laughs> According to my sources, I can tell you this morning, I have no idea. <laughs> Some people view working at the White House as kind of a big deal or an important job. But what I really want to tell you today is that my significance in life doesn't come from what I do, or where I work, it comes through living a life of integrity, through a life rooted in Christ. And that's what I want for you. I want for you to have a vital relationship with Christ and to live a God-honoring life. And many of you at the stage in life where you're searching for direction, planning for the future, God will direct your path. He will bless you. He'll give you opportunities to bless Him and to bless others if you allow him and if you follow him. Let me also say by way of introduction, I had a great weekend here at homecoming, visiting with friends and being on campus. I even ran the 5K on Saturday, just got my breath back. And there was the 50th anniversary of Spring Arbor University Radio, which was a big blast. And I <clears throat> attended my 25-year class reunion. 25 years. So as as Enjoyable as this weekend was, I have to tell you this morning, I'm feeling a little old. But it was a great weekend, but I want to put it in perspective for you. Today's chapel speaker is so old, he graduated from Spring Arbor College. Today's chapel speaker is so old, he remembers when there was no McDonald's in Spring Arbor. Today's chapel speaker is so old, his next door neighbors, when his family first moved to this town, used to include Burbridge, Gibbs and Whiteman. <laughs> Today's chapel speaker is so old, his Core 100 group was the first ever group to go to Cedar Bend. Yeah. True story. I survived. <laughs> and finally, today's chapel speaker is so old, he remembers Chaplain Ron Capico with no beard. Okay, that last one wasn't true. <laughs> Not even I'm that old, so. <laughs> Ron is a good, well, he used to be a good friend, and <laughs> thank you for inviting me this morning. It's a real treat to be here in chapel. And thank you for being here this morning, too. I had been working in Washington as a general assignment reporter for about four years when I was given a temporary assignment to go over to the White House and work for one month. Someone had left that job in my company and they needed somebody to keep the seat warm for about 30 days until they hired somebody else. So I went over there for my one month assignment. It was 1996, Bill Clinton was the president, he was running for re-election. I served my time there for the month and when that month came and went, I was still there, and I've been there ever since. So technically, I am starting the 18th year of my 30-day temporary assignment at the White House. <laughs> I want it right out at the beginning here. I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy who just happens to work in kind of a fascinating place. People are curious about the White House and my job, as I mentioned, so I thought I would just bring a few photos just to kind of show you the environment in which I work. 
and we'll show those now here. And when your work address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you never know who's going to show up when you arrive for work in the morning. That was a couple of weeks ago. I go through security, go through the front gate, and that's the view of the executive mansion from inside the fence. And I walk down the driveway toward the west wing where the Oval Office is located. And just to the left of the west wing is the press briefing room and the space where reporters get to work. That part is not glamorous. I go in and down to the basement, and there's a row of radio booths on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you've got CNN and Fox News and some other reporters, but that's my booth. That's my office in the White House. It's three feet wide, about six feet deep, and I can fit inside with my equipment, and there I am. And that is prime real estate because there's not a lot of space. It's close to the West Wing and the executive seat of power. I have a seat in the White House briefing room, and that's my view of the podium when the president comes in or the press secretary. Occasionally, we get to go around the grounds, the facility, and there will be events on the South Lawn. We'll watch departures and arrivals of Marine One, the presidential helicopter. But there are restrictions on, on campus there, and we have to uh, be very mindful of the rules and who's in charge. Over the years, occasionally, you will have the opportunity to be in the company of the president. In this case, it just happened to be I was one of six reporters in the Oval Office with George W. Bush for a few minutes. My job has also taken me to cover political conventions uh, the last number of years in cities all across the country. And I've been on hand for inaugurations right there in the nation's capital. So that just gives you just a little flavor, just a little bit of the environment. Oh, can't forget this. Every Christmas, reporters are invited to come with one guest to the White House meet the president and the first lady, you have about 15 seconds with them, say hello, hello, Merry Christmas, turn, take a picture, and you're moved out. <laughs> so, but it's nice, and I've had the chance to uh, take along each of my three children uh, in consecutive years uh, to meet the president. In fact, my daughter had a broken arm and her arm in a cast when we met George W. Bush and Mrs. Bush, and uh, the president signed her cast. So those, those, are nice, those are nice moments. We still have the cast, by the way. We saved it. <laughs> it's, it's a unique place. I get a front seat to watching a lot of news happen and political history. And it's a, it's a privilege to be in that kind of a setting. But I, believe me, I don't mention those events. I don't show you those pictures to try and impress you. I just want to have you get a sense of what it's like where I work every day. Now, during my time, I've covered three presidents and some big events. I was thinking about some of those notable news events over the last few years, and I got to thinking for many of you in this room, you might have only been five or ten years old when they happened. But I'll share a few anyway. A personal and it may sound like ancient history to some of you. A personal and professional highlight for me came in January of 1998 when I was granted a one-on-one -on -one interview with President Obama, excuse me, President Clinton in the Oval Office. <laughs> And I'll admit to you, I was more nervous about the small talk with the president ahead of the interview. I had my questions written out, so I felt pretty good about that. But the small talk, I didn't know what to do. But I was kind of saved a little bit by one of his staff members who had briefed him before the interview, telling the president that my wife and I had just had our second child a couple of weeks before the interview took place. So I got in, walked into the Oval Office, shook his hands, good morning, Mr. President. And before I knew it, he was asking about the baby kind of put me at ease. I was a good dad. I had a couple of photographs in my pocket. I said, would you like to see some pictures? And before I knew it, I'm sitting at his desk in the Oval, and he's looking at the pictures of my two-year-old daughter and my newborn son, and he's asking about the family. And that's, that's a nice personal moment that kind of put me at ease. But I, looking back, I have to say also that if that interview had been scheduled, at a different time, it might not have happened at all because the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke two weeks and two days after that interview. And for the rest of 1998, Washington was engulfed in a scandal that ultimately led to impeachment, and it was a year of very messy politics. September 10th, 2001, September 10th, I was with the presidential motorcade at the Pentagon for President Bush's helicopter departure. And less than 24 hours later, a hijacked plane slammed into the side of the Pentagon, not far from where I had stood the day before. 
On September 11th, instead of going to the White House that morning, I went to our SRN newsroom and studios a couple of miles from the White House in Arlington, Virginia, just across the river from Washington, D.C. And that's where we first learned of the two plane crashes in New York City at the World Trade Center. And as awful as the Twin Towers disaster was, the weight of the day's events really hit me when the Pentagon was hit a half hour later because the Pentagon was just a couple of subway stops away from where we were in our newsroom. And we quickly shifted from doing short news updates that we do every hour to full-length, continuous coverage of the unfolding events. I sat in the anchor chair for the first few hours. I was announcing the chaotic information as it came in, getting live updates. My colleagues would rush into the studio with the latest news, and we just simply repeated the story of the morning attack. And then in the midst of all of that breaking news, I'm trying to get a hold of my wife to let her know that I'm okay. In one sense, it was hard to be away from home during a crisis. We, at that time, had three kids all under the age of five. But on the other hand, it was a breaking news story. I was needed on the job. I wanted to be there. The adrenaline was flowing because it was a major breaking news story. But over the next 72 hours, I, was, uh, I spent very little time at home, and there were some long work days for, very many, for many weeks after that. January 20th, 2009, a little more recent. Inauguration Day for Barack Obama. This was the third presidential inauguration I had covered in person, and even though the weather is typically very cold in January on the 20th for the inaugurations and the hours are long surrounding that event, reporting from inaugurations in Washington is really a sight to see, and it's an honor. And our radio broadcast position, I have to tell you, is only about 25 yards away from the podium on the west front of the Capitol where it takes place. And it is really a fantastic perch to, uh, to watch and record the activity. Activities. And the crowd, staggering that day, had never seen a crowd like that in Washington, D.C. And you simply couldn't help but realize the historic nature of the event, of being there in person, the swearing in of America's first black president. And it was one of those, I can't believe I'm here moments. So there are three personal stories from the past three administrations. And, I, and I'll tell you, at the time of each of those stories, there was nothing bigger going on. Impeachment, 9-11 the Obama inauguration. But eventually, those events, like all events in all of life, were overshadowed and replaced by newer news. The Clinton and Bush administrations came and went. The Obama administration will change hands in three plus years. And the next president will face his or her own challenges. And who knows, maybe there will be future Clinton or Bush presidencies. But I'm not making any predictions. It's an endless cycle, and you, ha you see those patterns in Washington. But it's not just in Washington. It's not just in politics that we see those patterns. Throughout human history, kingdoms and nations have risen and fallen. Politicians are up. They're down. Radio news networks come and go. In Isaiah 40, people are described, you and I, we're described as grass. In verse 8, the grass withers and the flowers fade but the word of our God stands forever. That's a guarantee. And from what I've witnessed, it's true. Political promises, they're made and broken sometimes, but God delivers on his promises. It's tempting to put our hope in political institutions, but they are fallible and they will disappoint. Nothing endures but the word of the Lord. So, how did I end up working in Washington? I told you about the job, but how did I get there? I didn't necessarily know it at the time, but God opened doors and placed people in my path at several key intersections in life. I actively pursued these opportunities, and it's clear to me now that God was working behind the scenes, guiding my path. I was in eighth grade when I knew I wanted to work in radio. I found great interest and joy in recording my voice on my dad's old cassette tape recorder, interviewing my brother, kids across the street, and playing records in the basement, listening to music on my old Radio Shack headphones. And I spent a lot of time reading stories out of the newspaper, into the microphone, playing music, and I simply produced my own homemade radio shows. And one night on the real radio, there was a trivia contest on the local station, and I think I just happened to know the answer. So I called up the station, and I answered the question, and I won. The prize, by the way, was a $10 gift certificate to the Halloween department at Sears. <laughs> That's pretty good stuff. But for me, 
I, the true prize was talking to the DJ on the phone and being on the radio. I mean, that's all I, that's all I cared about. And after hanging up the phone, I was thinking about it. I thought that they would announce the winner after the song ended and that they might put my call on the air. So I quickly set up my equipment and I actually recorded when they played it back. And to this day, I have a recording, a copy of my first ever on-air radio experience, or on-air appearance, as a young teenager with a somewhat high-pitched and crackly voice. <laughs> but it was a dream come true in a lot of ways. And I probably didn't think about it much back in junior high, but when I was making, when I was making those homemade radio shows, but God had a plan for my life back then and was starting to pave that way. Of course, he has plans for, for all of us. God gives each of us different skills and personalities and dreams. He created in me a strong interest in things like drama and public speaking and media. And looking back, he has allowed me to pursue a vocation in the communication field. I can say to you this morning with confidence that my broadcasting journey has God's fingerprints all over it. And a critical part of that journey happened right here in Spring Arbor. My family moved here to town from across the country the summer before my senior year of high school. Summer before my senior year. Not the best timing for a teenager. But it worked out, and I was immediately drawn to the university radio station. As it turned out, I joined the radio staff two months before moving on campus as a freshman because I was here in town. They had a summer staff opening that just happened to open up, and I took advantage of it and jumped on. And for the next four years, I worked every imaginable on-air shift at the stations, including summers and holidays. In the classroom, I learned about broadcasting, and then I'd go across the hall into the studio and have that hands-on experience. And I did that right across the street in Sayre Hall, and I loved every minute of it. But beyond the radio station opportunity, as good as that was for me, there were outstanding people here on campus that shaped my Spring Arbor experience. Roger Varlin in Core 100, Tom Ball and Carl Jacobson in the Communication Department, Ron Capico on the Mexico missions trip, just to name a few. And I'm also thankful for students who became lifelong friends, faculty and staff who taught me and encouraged me. These were people, and I'm sure you have the same experience, people who were looking out for your personal and your spiritual well-being. And they've had a positive and lasting impact on my life. So after three years on campus as a student, I, there was a life-changing opportunity that came my way, and it was the fall of 1987. It was my senior year, and I attended the American Studies program in Washington, D.C. So I moved there for the fall semester, lived on Capitol Hill. Other students were there and we had uh, studies, but I also had an internship. And I interned at a radio news network called IMS News. It was a pretty small operation right there in the heart of Washington. It was run by a man named Forrest Boyd. And he himself was a former White House correspondent. And he covered Presidents Johnson and Nixon in the 60s and 70s. Forrest was a humble Christian man who had outstanding journalistic credentials. And he was an enormous influence on me at a time when I was grappling with how best to pursue my dream of broadcasting. He demonstrated how you could participate in the secular news arena, but still be involved in ministry. His professional passion was to do this, was to provide a network news service to Christian radio stations across the country. There had never been a news network that was targeting that audience before. So he was a, a true radio pioneer. But the idea was not to report religious news exclusively. He was reporting all of the day's news, but he was wanting to give religiously oriented stories their proper place. And he showed me firsthand how to do your job well without compromising your commitment to Christ. A few years later, he invited me to work with him in Washington at a brand new news network. And I took, took up the job offer with him. And in a funny but meaningful twist, a few years later when I was assigned to the White House, my first few years there, I was working in the very same little radio booth that he had worked in years earlier. And to this day, I still have his old phone number. So, that's part of my story. Your story is different. You might be studying business and not radio or communication. You might be studying science or art. You might have plans to be a teacher, a filmmaker, a coach, a therapist. You might be a stay-at-home parent. You might be called to full-time ministry. 
God has given each of us, each of you, a different set of skills and abilities and dreams. And what should we do with what we've been given? First Peter, each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, I knew pretty early on as a young teenager what kind of path, what kind of career to pursue, and that might not be your experience. It's pretty, you know, in fact, it's common for college students to begin their college time and not know exactly what path to take. It's common to change majors along the way. I don't know why I'm reporting in Washington, reporting news, as opposed to playing country music on a radio station in South Dakota. But here's the deal. I can live a life of significance in either scenario. There's a mystery to life and about the way God moves, and we need to be willing to completely trust his leadership and his direction and know that he will equip us for his purposes. And if we work heartily, heartily as for the Lord, as it says in the Bible, we should be about excellence. We should pursue excellence in all that we do. And in this world, as you well know, it's focused on success. What grades we get, how much money we earn, winning the election, getting to the playoffs, those are just some of society's barometers for success. And let's be honest, who doesn't want to succeed at what we, what we do? But I would caution that we don't make success the goal. In his book, Kingdom Assignment, author Denny Balesi points out the difference between success and significance. And here's the definition. He says, success is really as simple as accomplishing goals, whatever they are. He says then that significance is about setting your sights on accomplishing the right goals. And then from a Christian perspective, he goes on to say this, significance is living a God-honoring life by focusing on the right goals and doing what is important and meaningful. So that's the struggle that we face. There's tension there. There's tension between seeking success and searching for significance. One way to strive towards significance is to lean on the Lord. We need to use Him as our compass in life, not the world, but Him. For me, significance is not wrapped up in a job title. Reporting from the White House is what I do. It's not who I am. For me, true significance plays itself out in so many other ways in my life. It's achieved through my relationship with God, through loving my family, pointing my children toward Christ, showing respect for my coworkers, being there for the middle school boys in my church youth group, encouraging the guys that I play basketball with on Monday nights, it plays itself in countless ways in my life, and it does in yours as well. And our lives, our faith, affects other people. We all have a circle of influence, and that circle of influence is true here in Spring Arbor, and it's true in the nation's capital. This time in college for you is a critical time of discovery. Academically, you're discovering new concepts and information as you prepare for the future. Personally, you're discovering who you are and what you value. Spiritually, you're discovering who God is and his place in your life. I've discovered a God who is bigger than I can comprehend. I've discovered a God who has created us with special talents to serve him and to serve others. I've discovered a gracious God who forgives me. I've discovered a God who is faithful and in turn, I've been challenged to live a life of faithfulness to him. Living a life of genuine faith is not something that we achieve. We never really arrive at that. It's a lifelong endeavor. And we need to buckle up because we will face obstacles if we decide to follow Christ and honor him in our lives because it's a worldview and it's a lifestyle that's on a collision course with the world's thinking. But it can be done. I'll finish with this story. Ten years ago, the U.S. went to war in Iraq, 
and NBC's David Bloom was one of the TV news correspondents who covered the invasion. And he was a rising star at NBC. He had been at the White House, he was on the Today Show, he was about my age, and I didn't know him very well personally, but I ran into him uh, frequently when we were covering the White House in the early part of the Bush administration. Well, he got assigned over to cover the invasion in Iraq, and he gained a lot of attention for the Bloom Mobile. It was a special truck that they had net retrofitted with satellite equipment so that he could, he could file his reports as they're driving across the desert with the troops. And it was kind of a big deal. But he died in Iraq, but not before sending some eye-opening emails to his wife. I didn't know David's faith story until after he died, but it was clear that he had come to know the Lord. And here's part of what he wrote to his wife from the Iraqi desert just a few days before he died. Here I am, supposedly at the peak of my professional success, and I could frankly care less. It matters little compared to my relationship with you and the girls and Jesus. I know only that my whole way of life, of looking at life, has turned upside down. That was from an NBC News TV correspondent. And David Bloom got it. All too often, the priorities in life get out of whack. But he realized what was significant. Pursuing excellence in education, that's a good thing. Pursuing excellence in the workplace, that's a good thing too. There's value and there's satisfaction in a job well done. But let's not confuse success with significance. True excellence and significance comes through living a life of integrity, through living a life that's rooted in Christ. I'm thankful for a university where that's the perspective for learning, and I hope you are too. Thanks.